Green and the Black Rose of Queen. I wanted to give a shout out to Ring IQ Boxing and remember to tune in to the motherfucking relay. Welcome to the motherfucking relay where we're covering today's top boxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. I'm sure most of you have heard by now that Mayerling Rivas, reigning WBA Super Bantamweight Champion Mayerling Rivas, has signed a multi fight deal with Matchroom. Oh. A purposeful signing. If I do say so myself, I believe that they signed Venezuela's own Magyarling Rivas with two of their prized stallions, two of their ponies in that Super Bantamweight show. I think they signed it with those two ponies in mind. That's what I think. In the Super Bantamweight division, Matchroom has both Ellie Scottney and Ramla Ali to take care of. And I believe the reason they signed Magyarling is because at some point they want to match one of them against... At some point those two fighters are going to want to fight for world titles. Ellie Scottney was in action last month against former IBF champion Jorilina Guanini. Ramla's supposed to be in action later on this month on the undercard of Ortiz versus McKenson. I happen to think the people at Matchroom signed Venezuelan WBA champion Magyarling Rivas with these two fighters in mind. The Venezuelan won the WBA title at Bantamweight in June of 2015 and made three defenses before moving up to 122 pounds and won the WBA crown in her second tilt at the weight, having been edged out via split decision for the IBF title against Marcela Cunha in Argentina, October 2018. La Monita is looking to take on fellow champion Champions Jamie Mercado and Seguilin Lafarve, and has an eye on the winner of Shernika Johnson versus Melissa Esquivel, who will clash for the IBF title in April. The 34 year old cannot wait to get back into action. You could argue that Mayerlin Rivas is the apex predator at this weight. You could argue that in the absence of Argentinian champion Daniela Bermudez at 122 pounds, you could argue that Mayerlin is the apex predator. You know what I think the plan is? I'll tell you what I think, I'll tell you what I think. It's too soon for either Ramla Ali or Ellie Scottney to take on someone as seasoned as Magyarling Rivas. That can't be the play. Putting either one of those fighters in there with her inside of, I don't know, two to three fights, it's too soon for that. So what they might do is they might have Magyarling Rivas take on the other champions at this weight, finance those fights to prime the winner. The last woman standing in those unification matches. There are three active reigning champions at this weight, soon to be four once the outcome of Johnson versus Esquivel is decided, and among those champions, Magyarling Rivas is the most experienced. I think she's a better boxer than Jamie Mercado. More experienced than Lafarve. And more experienced than either Shernika Johnson or Melissa Esquivel. That being said, in many ways, she's the apex predator at this weight, and you could give her good odds to pry a belt away from any one of those fighters, any one of those champions. That's the situation. That's the case, and I think that's why the people at Matchroom chose to sign her as opposed to Jamie Mercado, as opposed to Siegeling Lafarve, who's a talented fighter, talented champion herself, but a young champion set to be defending her title, her WBO title, very soon. For the first time in a matter of weeks. The way I see it, they're going to try to have Mayer Ling unify the titles while Ramla Ali and Ellie Scottney amass experience, professional experience, because neither one of those two fighters, good fighters that they might be, neither one of them are prepared to take on someone as seasoned as Rivas just yet. That's what I think the play is, and it's a good play. The weakest link at this weight is Jamie Mercado. A young champion, though not necessarily a defensively sound one. Jamie Mercado is a mid-range to inside pressure fighter, a fighter that's not that hard to find in that ring, in that squared circle. And if I had to guess what unification match is likelier to happen than not, I'd guess it would be Rivas versus Mercado. Jamie Mercado, who's supposed to be defending the title very soon against Lobo Munoz. Defending her WBC title south of the border in a matter of weeks. If I had to guess, I think that's the unification match they try to make for Mayerling first. In the mean in between time, Ramla Ali, Ellie Scottney, they go through the gears, they have a couple of fights, amass some experience, so that they can inexorably take on Mayerling Rivas, or Really, whoever the last woman standing is, this is boxing after all. Anything can happen. Boxing is the theater of the unexpected. This recent revelation confirms the rumors we talked about here on the channel a few weeks ago. That they signed her. The rumor mill is spinning, and what it's spinning is that Magyarling Rivas was going to go into a multi-fight deal with Matchroom. The rumors, the stories, they checked out. That's very much the case. That's the situation. It's a great signing. It's also confirmation of what I told you. This division is going to be getting a lot more attention moving forward. Matchroom being a major promotional outfit, 
outfit with a platform deal, widely recognized in the world of boxing, having not just two, now three ponies in that super bantamweight show, staging fights there, it's conceivable that 122 pounds is set to get a lot more attention and those fighters are set to get a lot more exposure than they've been getting so far. The glamour weights have been 135, 130, to some extent 118 pounds more recently, but now 122 pounds. That's a division that's going to get a lot more exposure. The same exposure those divisions have been getting. Because now Matchroom is going to be staging even more fights there for their fighters. They've got two unbeaten up-and-comers and one active reigning world champion, arguably the most experienced in that entire weight class within their stable. So you can expect to see more activity at 122 pounds now that Matchroom has not just two, but three prize stallions in that super bantamweight show. It's very exciting. It's a great signing, and I look forward to seeing what they have in store for her. And the rest of their super bantamweights. In men's welterweight news, Josh Taylor says he's not against facing Kel Brock, but says 149 pounds is too high. Too high? What's this guy rehydrate to? I happen to think Josh Taylor needs to do whatever he has to do to get Kel Brock in the ring, because in the welterweight division, he won't have very many options. Taylor is open to facing Brooke, but feels a catch weight of 149 pounds is a bit too much. I'm not sure. Anyone, that's a big fight, Taylor told Sky Sports News. I just want to be in big fights now. Coming into the last three or four years of my career now, I'm not going to be here for much longer, so I want to be in the big fights. I feel I've deserved the opportunity to be involved in big fights now for a good few years as a pro. I fought all the best world challengers and come up the hard way, so I'm looking forward to being involved in big fights. Well, he needs to do what he has to do to be involved in this one, and what that might entail is a catch weight of 149 pounds, because Cal Brock, he can't keep making 147 pounds comfortably. You gotta meet him in the middle. It's a wonder he made a 149 pounds for Amir Khan. That high up at 149 pounds may be a little bit too big, but we'll see how it goes. You know what I'm like. I'll fight anybody and I'm not scared to fight anyone, so we'll see how it goes. As long as it's a big fight, I'm here for it. Promoter Ben Shalom of Boxer, who promoted Khan vs. Brooke, likes the idea of a Brooke vs. Taylor clash, but he also feels the contest is unrealistic because Brooke is unable to get down any lower than 149 pounds, and I I'll tell you something. The weight of the fight shouldn't be a problem because because there's no world title on the line. There's nothing holding these boys to a particular weight. Josh has got to be willing to make sacrifices. Beggars can't be choosy. He doesn't have a myriad of options in the welterweight division. He really doesn't. You got Kel Brook, maybe a potential Crawford fight. And what else? Florian Marco? That's the only other welterweight on the same side of the street as him, and you'll excuse me for saying so, but I don't think we're on the eve of Marku versus Taylor. Ben Shalom added. It was actually mentioned to me by some of Josh Taylor's team, Shalom told Sky Sports News. I think it's unrealistic. I think Josh will be at 147 pounds, and Kel, if he's gonna fight again, it will be at 149 pound minimum, if not more. I think Josh Taylor wants to take on the elite welterweights now, the world champions, the likes of Terrence Crawford. He wants to look for those big fights now. I think Kel Brook, he's either going to finish now or have one more. So I don't think that fight is realistic. And, you know, very recently we heard news by way of Connor Ben. They wanted to match Connor against Kel Brook. And Connor, in so many words, stated that Kel Brook priced himself out of that fight. That fight with Connor Ben. So if Kel's not going to retire, if he's going to stick around for one more fight, this fight might be ideal. But Josh, Josh has got to be willing to play ball. And if a fight between Josh and Kel ain't for no world title, then you don't need to worry about the weight. Moreover, Josh Taylor's a tall drink of water. Tall drink of water as far as a super lightweight or a welterweight goes. This guy's almost six feet tall. He can make 140. 49 pounds just fine. It's not that big a sacrifice. Given this guy's walk around weight, it's not the same thing as what we saw with Floyd Mayweather when he made sacrifices to take on Oscar De La Hoya. He had to give up weight to that guy. He had to move up to Oscar's prescribed weight. This ain't that kind of situation because we all know Josh Taylor's walk around weight is well above 149 pounds. He can get to 149 just fine for the bag, for the money. In that situation, he's not a champion. Not at 149 pounds, he's not a champion above 140 pounds. And in that situation, Kel Brook is the A-side. Kel Brook's got the name, he's got the leverage. They can bill that fight as a Sky Sports pay-per-view, but Josh has got to be willing to make sacrifices. This is all assuming that the rumors don't check out. This is all assuming that Amir Khan doesn't invoke his rematch clause and pushes for a second fight, a second fight with Kel Brook, because right now that's what the rumor mill is spinning. If that story don't check out and Kel Brook is free to fight, 
Josh Taylor and his team need to do whatever they've got to do to get that guy in the ring because he ain't got the buffer that Connor Ben has. Connor Ben's marquee value is quickly rising. Young Connor Ben, the son of Nigel Ben. And Connor's marquee value, the buffer that he has, it doesn't require him to fight for a world title in order to generate interest and sell tickets. That's the saving grace for Connor. For the most part, the PBC has the run of the place at 147 pounds, and most of the alphabet titles, they're on the PBC side of the street. We know how this has affected the career of reigning WBO champion Terrence Crawford. Connor Ben, he's got a buffer that most other welterweights don't have, and it's that he generates interest, he generates marquee value without a world title. Josh Taylor's got to play it that same way. He's got to try to fight in fights that people are interested in, even if they're not world title fights. You know, behind that performance he just had with Jack Catterall, I don't think he should go straight into a Crawford fight. I mean, I'm not against it. I should say I don't think it behooves him to go straight into a Crawford fight, though. If that's what he wants to do, I'll watch the fight. Regardless, better still, behind how that guy looked against Jack Catterall, fighting Terrence Crawford straight away, it's not a good idea, not for that guy. Keeping busy with Kel Brock and what could be billed as a Sky Sports pay-per-view might be the way to go, even if you have to give up two pounds to get him in the ring. There ain't that many options to go around. Josh Taylor's last fight left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. A lot of people feel that Jack Catterall should be the 140-pound division's reigning undisputed champion. Myself, I had Jack Catterall winning that fight by a point. Just a point, but still a point. I had Jack winning the fight. Josh Taylor needs to do whatever he has to do to make people forget. Erase that from their memories with a stellar performance, a better one than the one he just gave us against Jack Catterall. And one way he can do that is getting Kel Brock in the ring. A familiar face for everybody, a familiar face for the people here stateside in the United States and the people over there in the United Kingdom that just saw Kel Brock batter his domestic rival, Amir King Khan. At 149 pounds, the fight is intriguing enough that it's doable and you could bill it as a pay-per-view, but Josh has to play ball. You gotta be willing to make sacrifices. And is it even really a sacrifice fighting Kel Brock at 149 pounds when we all know that Josh Taylor rehydrates to well above 149 pounds? I mean, we know that. So instead of cutting down to 140 or 147, you cut down to 149 pounds. That's the sacrifice. Josh Taylor ain't got a lot of options above 140. And he did say he's moving up. He said as much. He said he's not returning to the 140 pound division. So if you're not gonna do an immediate rematch against Jack Catterall for all the belts, you plan on moving up to 147 pounds, but it's not quite the right time for a Terrence Crawford fight. This is a potential opponent option that needs to be explored. One that could make Josh Taylor more money than he's made. Yeah, more money than he's made with anybody so far. At 140 pounds, the WBA have now officially ordered Josh Taylor to defend his super lightweight world titles against Alberto Puello next. Assuming he vacates the belts and moves up in weight as expected, Ismael Barroso, WBA number two, would seemingly be next in line, then O'Hara Davies, WBA number three. The idea that O'Hara Davies is anywhere close to sniffing for a world title. That's mind-boggling is what that is. Even more mind-boggling is that the WBA didn't order an immediate rematch between Jack and Josh. Given the controversy and association with that fight and how it was scored, you would have thought that the WBA would have taken a similar stance with this fight than the one they took with Murata versus Endom 1. There was some controversial scoring in that fight as well. The fight was given to Endom where most people felt Murata had won the fight and on premise of that, they ordered an immediate rematch, but that's not the case here. Jack Catterall is ranked by the WBA. He ranks in at number 10, though I think the difference is Ryota Murata is a cash cow in the land of the rising sun. There's a lot of money in association with that guy, whereas Jack Catterall, he's not a cash cow in the UK. I think that's what the difference is. That's unfortunate. Josh Taylor's all set to leave 140 and campaign as a welterweight, and just in keeping with the theme of welterweight news, news broke earlier yesterday that Conor Ben is in fact going to be taking on Chris Vin here a fight that I'm not excited about, I'm not excited about it, but I'm not critical of it either. That same Chris Van Heerden very recently took on Jaron Boots Ennis. Yeah, a few fights ago. Jaron Ennis has more pro fights, more pro experience than Conor Ben does. So if he was good enough for Jaron Boots Ennis, why wouldn't he be good enough for Conor Ben? Conor Ben don't come from some deep Olympic amateur background. These two boys are more or less in the same age group. Like I said, it's not a fight that I'm excited about, but it's not a fight that I'm critical of either. It's one of those situations to where the people you see tearing down 
Conor Ben for this fight. These are the kind of people that whenever a guy's a little bit popular and he's got some money behind him, they think it's okay to tear him down. Something similar to what we see with Anthony Joshua, Canelo Alvarez, Katie Taylor to an extent, to a lesser extent, that's what's going on with Conor. It's one of those situations to where they know this kid's popular enough that he don't need to fight for a belt to make money. And because of that, people are super critical of him. It's one of those situations. And I'm not going to tell you that I'm excited about this fight because I'm not, but I'm not going to be super critical of it either. 147 pounds is one of the most political divisions in the entire sport of boxing. It's a wonder that Conor Ben can be as popular as he is, given that fighting for world titles at that weight, when the time comes, it could prove difficult, because the PBC more or less has the run of the place. Most of the alphabet titles are on that side of the street, yet in spite of that, Conor Ben still generates interest domestically with his fights. And if he's keeping busy with a Chris Van Heerden, given where he is in his career, I'm okay with it. I'm not going to lie to you. If he wins this fight, I want to see somebody better the next time out. A mighty Mo Hooker, a mean machine. We know that old fish eyes Frank Warren, he expressed some interest in making a fight between Connor and David Avenizi. And I actually like Connor's chances in all of those fights. I think they're all interesting fights. And I want to see one of those fights the next time out. But for the time being, yeah, I'm okay with this. Just in keeping with the theme of welterweight news, Virgil Ortiz wants a Spence fight next. Says it will be the biggest fight in Texas history. The 23-year-old Ortiz is ranked number one by both the WBC and the WBO, number two by way of the WBA, and number four by way of the IBF, and he feels that he is ready for a championship opportunity after back-to-back -back wins against former world titleist Maurice Hooker and former world title challenger Igis Kavalioskis. I think a fight with Spence will be the biggest fight in Texas history of all time. Hands down, Ortiz told BoxingScene.com in an interview, I know that it would happen at the Cowboy Stadium, and it would say out. It's really exciting. But we have to get there first, and you know what? For what it's worth, I don't think Virgil Ortiz is off base. A fight between Spence and Virgil in the state of Texas could be very commercially successful. Ortiz said the 31-year-old Spence should capitalize on the opportunity to fight him sooner before he enters his physical prime. I think so. I'm only getting better, stronger, and faster with every fight. I'm only getting more experience, so I would say so, said Ortiz. I would take those risks. Without risk, there is no reward. You can't not take risks and expect to be great. Given Virgil Ortiz's position by way of the alphabet rank standings, he's closing in on a title shot, whether people like it or not. And he's got Errol Spence in his crosshairs. Spence versus Ugas is a competitive fight, no doubt about that, said Ortiz. I would give Spence the edge. I'm not saying he's going to win or that he's going to blow him out or anything, but I give him the slight edge. Ugas is definitely a game fighter. It can honestly go either way. In April of 2020, Ortiz said he would be ready to fight Spence by 2022, so that he could have the chance to beat Spence while his opponent was still in his prime, and 2022 is here, folks. Virgil Ortiz is knocking on the door of an Errol Spence Jr. fight. The problem is, we don't know if Errol's gonna win his next fight. And even if he does, we don't know if he's gonna stay at welterweight. Couple that with the politics of boxing, that Spence is a PBC fighter, whereas Virgil fights for Golden Boy promotions. And that he'd be a high-risk, low-reward opponent for Spence. I'm just saying, I wouldn't hold my breath waiting for this one to happen. It might not.